Hi. Hi. It's crazy. So um, I said, yes, I'm going to stand behind the podium. But anybody who knows me knows that I can't really, really stand behind the podium, at least not for a long time. Um, I'll get back there in a minute. Um, where I want to begin with you guys. Um, first, I think I just want to uh, welcome everyone to, uh, to the Bay Area. And I think that I want to um, maybe blah, blah, blah through my body just a second so that you get a sense of um, kind of the, the physical manifestations of my creative practice. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, cool. See. Awesome. Um, our ancestors hacked bitterly at sugarcane. We are the sweet, never tasted by their sweat-soaked tongues. They begged for us to be here, never knowing who or what we'd become. We are their echoing elegy, perpetually sung. We are their echoing elegy, per of snakes and trees, like Adam and Eve. From leaves to roots, fascination with family is a taste for strange fruit. So strange, looks like a darker version of you. My story is a sojourn on the back of a snake crossed the seas in pursuit of the music, settled in a space where drum and bass and blood and sweat kneel down to pray. Fascination with family is a taste for strange fruit. My family tree transplanted in America bears me. I am you. Thanks. Thanks, cool, so just a sense. Um, once upon a time, amidst a once-in-a-generation sweep of civil and human rights activity in America, an act of Congress initiated the founding of the National Endowment for the Arts. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, among the first class of NEA grantees was the Martha Graham Dance Company, a pilot program in New York City, Detroit, and Pittsburgh entitled Poets in the Schools. Alvin Ailey, Merce Cunningham, Jose Limon, and Paul Taylor. While arguing on the Senate floor on behalf of the NEA, Senator Claiborne Pell said, I believe that this cause and its implementation has a worldwide application, for as our cultural life is enhanced and strengthened, so does it project itself into the world beyond our shores. Let us apply renewed energies to the very concept we seek to advance, a true renaissance, the reawakening the quickening, and above all, the unstunted growth of our cultural vitality. In the same debate, Senator Hubert Humphrey argued that this is at best a modest acknowledgement, that the arts have a significant place in our lives, and I can think of no better time to place some primary emphasis on it than in this day and age when most people live in constant fear of the weapons of destruction, when, uh, which cloud man's mind and his spirit and really pose an atmosphere of hopelessness for millions and millions of people. The arts seldom make the headlines. We are always talking about a bigger bomb. I wonder if we would be willing to put as much money in the arts and the preservation of what has made mankind and civilization as we are in the lack of civilization, namely war. Once upon a time, resourcing the economies of art and ideas was a matter of national priority. In 1978, the NEA's annual budget was $124 million, which is about $400 million in today's economy. And then something happened. <laughs> Morning in America. In the midst of deficits and high unemployment, Ronald Reagan sought to impel Congress to completely phase out funding for the NEA over a three-year period. He was not successful. Um, but his signal served as a harbinger 
to the further attack on cultural funding that has played out over the last three years or 30 years. Um, primary villains of federal cultural funding include um, Donald Wildman of the American Family Association, Senator Jesse Helms, Newt Gingrich, Pat Robertson, you know the deal. Um, against the backdrop of culture war and xenophobia, private cultural philanthropy has served as a tool of resistance and sustainability for the arts sector in America. I personally have benefited from my relationship with several grant makers in the arts. Um, I, as John said, I am a grant maker. I give and receive. I sustain culture. I am an artist. I give and receive. I sustain culture. I am also an arts presenter. And one of my heroes and mentors in this profession is the executive director of Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, Ken Foster. Yay, Ken. In his book, um, Performing Arts Presenting from Theory to Practice, Ken discusses the contraction of the NEA, its procedural and infrastructural impact on the business of making and presenting art, the correlation between the conservative rhetoric and action of the culture war and the conservative lean away from risk taking by arts presenters in America. He dubs the latest era of adaptation an age of collaboration. He talks about an ecological way that many of us now view the arts. In framing cultural production in this environmental way, he talks about the performance experience as an equilateral relationship between the artist, the art, and the audience. He further articulates that inside of this relationship, we have a collective responsibility to the greater good of the arts matrix. I want to use these ideas to talk about the philanthropist's role in relationship to the sustainability of creativity in America and use my personal experience to answer a number of questions relative to the philanthropist's responsibility in desperate times. So these are the big questions. What is the 21st century response to Pell's notion of unstunted growth of our cultural vitality? What does collaboration inside the arts ecology look like? What is the artist's role, and very specifically the theater company's function in the 21st century arts matrix? And how does a theater company function in the 21st century? In responding to these questions, we're going to talk about hybridity, cultural innovation, and social accountability. The theme of this conference is the velocity of change. My primary suggestion to you today is that there's no use in trying to keep up with the change. You can't outrun it. You can anticipate its direction and in a future thinking way, get out in front of it before it leaves you behind altogether. So. Um, let's begin with a quick survey of a fairly ordinary theater company in the Bay Area, The Living Word Project. Um, though our methodology and mission statement fall out of familiar norms for American theater companies, our modalities and presentations do not. Witness, um, Word Becomes Flesh, which is a transition from a solo work supported by the National Performance Network to canonical text performed by alumni in You Speak's Brave New Voices uh, network, which is currently touring throughout the United States and Europe. Left Coast Leaning, which is a curatorial exercise meant to codify an aesthetic, um, enhance audience understanding and appreciation for regional synergies, increase visibility for local and regional artists, and present the idea that aesthetic tastes reach beyond immediate aesthetic manifestations. Reflections of Healing, in where, wherein we use a theatrical methodology very similar to the civilians or Anna DeVere Smith, which results in the placement of 10 different murals throughout Oakland's public library system. The end result is transforming iconography of the local environment. Um, and the breaks and the piece that John just mentioned, Red, Black, and Green, and Blues, these are works produced in the last three years scheduled to tour um, for more than 100 performances in 50 US cities. Mirrors in every corner, Tree City Legends, in partnership with Intersection for the Arts, um, the development and production of new work by emerging playwrights that enjoy runs of five weeks or more in a local theater. Um, and then a hybrid program of artists in residence and public educational residency programs, a family of URLs and frequently updated social networks to promote this work. So in summary, this is our theater company. 
We do repertory work that pulls from um, a pipeline of artists in our Young Artists Affiliate. We have a robust curatorial practice, a visual arts ethnography and iconography study, a national touring schedule, a local development and production slate, a pedagogical framework with internal and exported manifestations, and a visible and shifting online life. So my question for this body is, is all that activity enough? Or is it too much? Okay, um, in answering the question of enough, uh, the Living Word Project has um, welcomed into our folds um, one of the most amazing artists that I th think we have here in the United States. His name is Theaster Gates, and I wanna show you very quickly, um, thanks. Um, I wanna show you very quickly a um, portion from Red, Black, and Green, a blues in which um, Theaster indirectly addresses this question of enough. Thank you all for coming out tonight. My arms are long. I know tonight was supposed to be a conversation about my native art practice. The music that I do, abandoned buildings, art objects. My back is strong. I wanted to instead have a conversation about belief. My skin is here. Maybe how uh, belief in advance of any particular material my is the beginning of my practice that the material output is just a byproduct of belief. My investment in abandoned buildings, my investment in dancing or song, my investment in a studio project, a studio practice, starts with believing that materials have redemptive quality, that poor places have redemptive qualities, that someone has to believe in the poor. So I've come to adopt a politic of state. A politic of like, instead of moving when I could, when I make a little bit more money, what happens if I stay? And I use those extra resources to do something close. For people, not just like me class-wise. The people who uh, were like my parents, who were also maids, who were also cab drivers, who were also factory workers. My life. What happens if we all leave? That this is an art practice about believing. A design practice of believing. A dance practice of believing. A studio practice of believing. Believing is architecture. Believing is urban planning. Believing is engagement. Believing is breathing. It's just uh, one of my favorite human beings on earth. Um, in answering the question of enough, the Living Word Project has distilled the Astor's comments in three significant ways. Um, the first is in the emerging theory that intentional community design is arts practice. Secondly, we've adopted the developer strategy of constructing critical adjacencies to maximize revenue potential and transitioned it to a cultural framework to maximize invested audience constituencies. We've melded these two philosophies into a theory of change penned by Jeff Chang in a Doris Duke commissioned essay under the idea of the creative ecosystem. We've, uh, we live this um, in our theater company and more than 100 partner organizations around the country all working together in a performance structure come civic engine resource called Life is Living. Um, let me take a step back and um, illustrate what I mean by a critical adjacency. The retail model looks a little something like this. Um, developer A builds a Safeway on the corner of 51st and Broadway in Oakland. The Safeway is at a great location. It serves four neighborhoods uh, with an aggregate of about 50,000 residents. However, the Safeway becomes an even more attractive destination when you put a Payless uh, shoe store next to it. Um, and then add, add a Wells Fargo next to that 
and a Starbucks and a Long's Drugs, et cetera, et cetera. In this way, an artificial community is created based on diverse consumption and proximity. Among these entities, the shared value is the amassment of profit, though they have different methods of building wealth. Life is living applies similar logic, but instead of real estate, community is constructed on an art and pedagogically based cornerstone. And instead of financial profit at the center of these partnerships or adjacencies, the partners led by the Living Word Project place one critical issue at center, and that issue is life. In this model, the foundational partners um, are philanthropic organizations, artists, academic institutions, arts presenters, and environmental agencies. Each is called to convene a group of their constituents to an open share setting built around a singular question, what sustains life in your community? The answers are sometimes rooted in environmental sustainability, but often veer towards the colloquial, the colloquial and the absurd. Frenchie's Chicken Shack sustains life in Houston, just as Beyonce does. City Slicker Farms sustains life in Oakland, just like Urban Relief does. The composite responses that these partners and constituents elicit become the foundation for a single-day eco-themed festival in an under-resourced public space. The festival is called Life is Living, and like the retail model, it involves a shared value and a plurality of methodologies. This, however, is a model built on relationships, and this is what it looks like. When we first produced this festival four years ago, the event itself was our focus. And we adopted the available language to describe our uh, intentions. We called it a green festival, which was code for, if we call it green, maybe participants will respond in an environmentally responsible way to the site of most deaf performing for free at a local park. However, after we got scolded by folks that were doing critical environmental work about our use of their terminology, we conceded that we were excellent at drawing crowds and producing art, but it was disingenuous to claim to be an eco-agency when that so clearly wasn't our area of expertise. Instead, we fell back on the two pillars of our mission statement. The first is that we create safe space, and the second is that we um, create interdisciplinary performance interdisciplinary collaboration. So we shifted from placing the event at center to placing the varied relationships at the center of our work. We concentrated on the event as an extension of our mission to make safe space and engaged in sustained conversations with a plurality of groups, asking them each to consider the question of life. As Frarian pedagogues, this idea of inviting multiple constituents to develop language and participatory responses to one question is consistent and harmonious with our ultimate desire to impel radical change within our communities. Very simply, in addition, to local and touring repertory work and visual art projects, educational program, online life, et cetera, our theater company's most successful modality is its function as the hub of a localized interdisciplinary network. The network meets monthly, shares ideas, builds community, and produces shared space in which to make collective ideas manifest. We connect artists to philanthropy, to academic institutions, to environment and health. This model presents a learning opportunity for both art makers and grant makers. For our theater company, in relationship to the question of enough, our primary lesson is that it is not enough to place art in community without community context. In a mercurial way, there is an obvious truth to our efforts from an audience development perspective. On one hand, we've built up this cachet in our local community by hosting a free, popular public event every year. Not so coincidentally, we hosted Life is Living just two days ago, Saturday, October 8th, and we're gonna premiere a new work 10 miles away, or three BART stops away, on Wednesday, October 13th. No amount of Facebooking or flyering can substitute for genuine public proximity and investment. Second, by partnering with 30 different organizations over the course of several months, we've welcomed grassroots momentum into what Michael Kaiser of the Kennedy Center calls our family. 
broadening our own constituent circle by organizing safe space for other organizations to share resources, intellectual property, and audience exposure. Life is Living is a laboratory of crossover experiences within, wherein hip-hop generation audiences are exposed to multiple platforms for relationship. Presumably, this means that the young man who came just to produce bicycle-powered energy for our dance stage will fall in love with Talib Kweli and then will later join us in the theater space because of an experiential trust not just an aesthetic curiosity. Most importantly, this model reflects Theaster's suggestion that art happens everywhere and can happen for anyone, which partially means that more than exporting art into traditional performance spaces, we can import performance aesthetics into non-traditional public spaces. And here is the core of everything I've really been trying to say for the last 20 minutes. <laughs> Um, the ultimate thesis for this particular model is that art is not an object or outcome only. Not only. Art is a process, an opportunity for community as well. Correspondingly, grant making in the arts can't solely be about objects and outcomes. Innovative grant making also anticipates process and encourages collective opportunities. We have difficulty in the arts community tracking the total civic stimulus of the arts economy because we tend to focus on objects like plays or paintings and CDs and the corresponding sales figures. But the actual gross stimulus provided by the arts includes everything from clothes that you buy for a night at the ballet to the very livelihoods of everyone in this room. Similarly, the measure of cultural stimulus cannot just be measured by the aggregate of dance works or compositions and sculptures that are resourced by the entities in this room or independently. The hidden metric of cultural stimulus in America is the scale and health of partnerships within our creative ecosystems. The degree to which all organizations or artists benefit from the success of others. The degree to which organizations or artists can tie their successes to the growth of others. A partial flaw in our current system is that we can't fund everyone. I'd be the first to tell you that not all applicants are competitive for all grants, and that's cool. I don't need to be on the same court with LeBron James just because I played a year of JV basketball, and I shouldn't be on the same funder's docket as John Santos just because my friends tell me they like my conga playing. What we can change in our structure is the disproportionate emphasis on object with a focused priority on interdependence, supplanting the idea of the ego system with the radical notion of ecosystem. We can advocate for funding design that impacts more than one initiative at once, locating our investments in collaborative projects that encourage artists and arts organizations to work across broad networks to stimulate audience investment, shared growth, and sustainable processes that last beyond a culminating point of production so that our relationships don't end when the investment does. This investment in networks has a storied history in both government and private practice. I can't say that my own professional trajectory would have been dead in the water without the National Performance Network, which continues to foster relationships among artists, partner organizations, and constituent communities. These networks serve disparate organizations that are generally spread out around a state, if not the country. But what if we supported interdisciplinary networks with more finite within more finite geographical areas, presenting artists and arts organizations with infrastructure to properly contextualize their work within community, and nonprofits with more service and policy-based agendas access to the creative problem solving and aesthetic skills of representative organizations. Well, here's where the rubber meets the road. In January 2010, Grant makers in the arts launched their national capitalization project, and at their October meeting last year in Chicago, GIA released a summary document which stressed the importance of well-capitalized organizations and added that we repeatedly came back to the fact that the most common source of capital is accumulated surpluses. We agreed that getting organizations to achieve a surplus would require encouraging a significant shift in nonprofit practice and culture, a challenge we thought well worth undertaking. In September 2010, the National Center for Charitable Statistics published a paper uh, titled Operating Reserve Policy Toolkit for Nonprofit Organizations. I'm an artist, but I do my homework, okay? 
<laughs> Peep Game, the document was produced in partnership with the Center on Nonprofits and Philanthropy at the Urban Institute and United Way Worldwide. In this paper, the conspiring groups recommended that nonprofits have 25% of annual operating budget on hand at any given time during the fiscal year, which is to say that nonprofits should have three months cash reserve on hand at any given time. You look at this chart, which was published by the Nonprofit Finance Fund earlier this year. Um, these numbers come from their third annual survey of 1,900 nonprofit leaders, and they're incredibly predictive in nature. Nearly three in four arts organizations expect to operate at or below break even in 2011. Two thirds of arts nonprofits were in possession of less than recommended surplus levels at the time of the survey. Two thirds of organizations expect to amass revenues within 5% above or below organizational operating costs. In simple terms, if we are waiting for the sector to build or rebuild balance sheets independent of new philanthropic dollars, it will take a minimum of five years for those functioning at the 5% surplus level to generate even the equivalent of a three months um, of additional cash reserves. If these are the statistics that represent arts nonprofits or arts organizations, if arts organizations are functioning at these levels, you can only imagine what independent artists are facing. So here we are, two concurrent crises in our field, audience development and fiscal health. We need new invested constituents and we need leveraged balance sheets. We can pump new philanthropic dollars into the 33% of arts organizations that are operating with a slight surplus and ignore the sustainability of the rest of the field in which 66% of the field will die. We can spread our resources around to the organizations that are operating within the 5% break-even margin and assume that they'll innovate both their programming and fundraising structures, or we can change. It will most likely take multiple strategies executed by multiple grant makers to push our field toward more robust health. This morning, I shared with you a model a thesis that I believe stimulates local programmatic interdependence. The model has been both challenging and effective, and it's fed my arts practice so much that my new performance work is based on the experience. Uh, Red, Black, and Green, a Blues is about the process of doing Life is Living here in the Bay Area in Oakland, but also in Houston, in Harlem, and in Chicago. And I'll be sharing that piece on tour um, that starts this weekend. That said, I invite you to remember the thesis more than the model. Beginning with the contraction of the NEA in the early 90s, the arts community has been in a consistent state of adaptation. On the spectrum of adaptation, we are currently moving through a state of aesthetic and infrastructural collaboration. In order for the majority of us to survive, it is not enough to simply make or fund art. We also have to make or fund art in community context. How does an artist function in the 21st century? hybridity, cultural innovation, social accountability. The theme of this conference is the velocity of change. My primary suggestion to you today is that there's no use in trying to keep up with the change. You can't outrun it. You can anticipate its direction and in a future thinking way, get out in front of it before it leaves you behind altogether. I thank you so much for your time and listening to us.